He's been working at UGA for 32 years. He, in that time, has published quite a few books. One just most recently last summer on crop pollination. And he's actually working on another book currently um, on, don't tell me, social evolution, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. Um, he does research on multiple mating as well as bee vaccinations for viruses, which is current. I'll let him tell you all about that, but it's pretty fascinating. And just a fun fact, you guys are in the presence of, of someone who's been awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire in 2014. <laughs> So without further ado, and then I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself as well, but this is Dr. Keith Delaplane. Thank you. Well, thank you kindly, Ashley. Um, I guess that does merit a little bit of explanation, doesn't it? It's uh, the most excellent order of the British Empire. I was living in England, well, worked in England quite a bit, but in 2012 and 13, I was living over there on sabbatical, and they nominated me for this heraldic order called the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. You know, the Brits, they love their adjectives, the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. But the technicality is I'm not a knight because you have to be a citizen of the Queen's realm to be a knight. So I tell people I'm really just a squire. So, <laughs> hey, I'll take it. You know, a squire of the British Empire, sure. Um, I'm going to stand down here because I can't see my screens otherwise. And yes, I, I do sort of crutch off what's on the screen, so I'm gonna stand down here if that's okay with you all. Well, thank you for having me. Not having me once, having me twice. You know, to be invited once is one thing, to be invited back, you know, that's special. So thank you, thank you for coming and having me again. And thank you for filling this room. It makes me feel important. You know, so thank you for being here. I'm going to talk to you today, and I got three lectures um, that are going to be covering a, a lot of stuff. Today is the biogeography, the distribution, and some of the evolution of honeybees. And my second talk is going to be on mutiny and things that can go wrong in the hive other than mites. You know, there are other problems in bees that, than just varroa mites. So I'll be talking about that in that back ballroom in that direction. And then I'm also giving a talk uh, toward the end of the day on pollinator partnerships with honeybees. Uh, we're finding that a lot of pollinators, it's not just this pollinator versus that pollinator, it's when you combine pollinators that you really get some good action on crop pollination. So those are the three things I'll be covering today. And um, they're sort of big picture lectures. They're kind of lectures that kind of stand back a little bit and look at the honeybee from a holistic and broad view. And I always find that refreshing. It's nice as beekeepers to kind of know the backstory of our animal. And it helps us explain and understand things that we see every time we go inside the beehive. And we may not even think about it. Oh, why do they do that? When in fact there is a deep story behind that. And so that's kind of the perspective where I'm at today, and I hope you'll find it interesting. And my first talk is actually has two titles. I sometimes alternate between that title versus this one. Three invaders in 30 years, three pests, their impacts, and why are they so different, or the one that you came here to hear, out of Africa, Asia, honeybee biogeography and what it means for beekeepers. They're both the, kind of the same thing, because I'm going to frame this lecture in terms of three pests that I have lived through in my 32-year career, 32 year career at University of Georgia. And I think many of you here in this room will um, kind of be right there with me in your memories as well. But those three pests had three very different histories in this host animal, Apis mellifera. This is our animal, the honeybee, Apis mellifera. And that's important because I'm gonna be talking today about other Apis. You know, Apis is the genus of which there's about 20 species. Mellifera is simply one of them. Uh, mellifera, of course, is the one that's been exported around the world and is the kingpin of beekeeping all around the world. It's the species that you and I have in our hives. It has the virtue of being very manageable. Not all species are. 
Um, Sometimes, I mean, think about it. Some species are, are amenable to human management, uh, the majority are not. Um, think, for example, of zebras versus horses. Okay, I'm not an equestrian, but people promise me that zebras cannot be tamed. Horses can. You know, what's the difference? They're just a horse, right? It's, one's a barcoded horse, and the other is just a regular horse. But you know, horses are horses. But you know, zebras just don't tolerate human management, but horses do. So there is a genetic proclivity in different species to to tolerate the kinds of management and interference that we do to them. And honeybees are one of them. It's also a happy accident that two of the most easily inherited characters in honeybees are gentleness and honey production. And humans have been interacting with Apis mellifera for, for mm, it's at least a million years in their current form, probably shorter than that in the terms of hundreds of thousands of years. So it's, it's still a long time that we've been interacting with them. And there has been a kind of accidental genetic selection that we have practiced on them that has made them gentler and has made them more productive. And to our benefit, uh, they're very genetically responsive to those characters. So what we see today is a modern honeybee that has been influenced by human selection. It's relatively gentle and is far more productive than it needs to be. And by needs to be, I mean just natural selection. Our action on them has amped that up and made them more productive than they need to be for their own simple survival. Um, it's been good, good for us. I think the jury is out of whether it's been good for them, but that's how it is. Our, our relationship as two species is, is very ancient. I want to talk about these three pests. And this is, um, this, this is a picture back in the early 90s of the tracheal mite. Who's heard of the tracheal mite? Okay, good. All right, well, this, this was the big deal when I showed up at University of Georgia. This is back before I was colorizing my hair. So that's me right there in that picture at a microscope. And I was fresh from LSU, and I took the job at, in Athens at Georgia. And this was the thing. I mean, this is the, this is the front burner, top issue. And we had uh, beekeepers in Georgia who were losing hives by the thousands. The Georgia Department of Agriculture was depopulating apiaries. If you were positive for this mite, the inspectors would come in and depopulate apiaries. So this was like walking into a firestorm uh, when I showed up. Uh, the tracheal mite is a microscopic mite. It's very, very hard to see with the naked eye. It's like a fleck of dust, maybe. And it lives inside the tracheal tubes of adult bees. And that's what I'm doing here is I'm doing a dissection. You've got to rip the head off a bee and then look at it under a microscope to expose these tracheal tubes. And you can see these little opaque objects inside the tracheal It's like our, our tracheal tube you know, in your lungs. It's part of the respiratory system of the bee. And they would mechanically clog that up. And so for the first two years, there was a whole scramble of trying to find remedial controls for it. Uh, Man Lake Supply was really active in promoting uh, menthol as a treatment. Um, and and we, we did research, and Diana Samatero did research in Tucson about the efficacy of vegetable oil shortening patties. And the vegetable oil, they would eat the sugar in the patty and get the oil on their body, and it would make the mite, you know, they couldn't find the tracheal, you know, the spherical here on the side where they could go in. So it kind of messed them up. So this was the big thing. And then I woke up one morning, and it was not the big problem anymore. It just went away. It lasted maybe two years of crisis, mayday, mayday, all hands on deck, and then it just stopped. They, they, they went away. Um, great for job security. You know, I say, yo, I got that problem solved, Dean. You know, what do you think of this new assistant professor that came in? Well, I wish it could be my credit, but it's not. Uh, and we're going to be talking about this today. Why was this experience so dramatic at first, so ephemeral, and so quickly passing away? Well, the next problem was a little more grim. We had in 1997, 1987 in this country, uh, the Varroa mite first showed up. In Georgia, it showed up about 1993. And it's been a very different experience, hasn't it? 
We have an external mite here, visible to the naked eye, reproduces in brood, uh, it parasitizes brood and adults, it vectors viruses, this bee here is showing the most distinctive of these viruses, deformed wing. Um, we have worked for years to try to establish low chemical controls for this pest using sampling. This is a bottom board sticky sheet coming up with treatable thresholds. If you have this number of mites, you don't need to worry about treating, but if you have this level of mites, then you do. That kind of IPM philosophy has dominated research on varroa mites. There's been a lot of effort in trying to come up with non-chemical ways to resist it, including screen bottom boards, like you see right here on this hive body. You tip it back and that's got a screen floor. We've tried powder dusting uh, and demonstrated that it has no real efficacy. There's been a lot of interest in genetic resistance to varroa mite. What you're seeing in this little thumbnail is a schematic showing how you can select for hygienic behavior. Uh, you can take a piece of PVC and screw it into sealed brood, pour in some liquid nitrogen, it freezes the brood, kills it, put it back in the hive, and then you can take it out after 24 hours and see if that circle of brood has been removed or not. This bullet right here, the little one in the far right there, has intermediate brood removal, whereas this one has a complete brood removal. So you'd want to select from this stock right here. So in that one minute, I've summarized kind of the whole 20 or 30 year effort in varroa mites. How can we find treatable thresholds, how can we resist them using the lowest chemical footprint possible? And, you know, it's been kind of a mixed result, hasn't it, over the years? But the point I'm making is Varroa has been a much different experience than the tracheal mite was. In 1997, we had another pest show up in Georgia. It was documented in in 97, in, in actually about 1995, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, the small hive beetle. Uh, this is a the most recent of these exotic pests to show up, and I think the jury is kind of out on it. It's a um, this is kind of interesting here. There are bees that seem to show some demonstrable resistance to it. It's a big hive invader. Adults will physically attack it, but curiously, without much efficacy. You know, the, the beetles are pretty robust. Well, the adults are one thing, the larvae are another. But yeah, these are the beetles, you know, you know preying upon the brood. Um, you know, the beetles, you know, they're, they're kind of in between the two, in my opinion. They're in some areas, in some situations, with some weak colonies, they're devastating, especially small colonies, mating nukes and observation hives, they really hammer them badly. But I would say safely overall, they have kind of been intermediate between those two pests that I've talked about. So three pests in 30 years with three very different histories. And using that context, I'm going to talk about the biogeography of Apis mellifera that I think gives some explanations for these experiences of beekeepers and points to the possibility of future solutions for it. This is our species, Apis mellifera, in its natural range to the left. It's the red shaded zone. Apis mellifera is commonly called the western honeybee, and that's in context to its sister species, Apis serrana, which is the eastern honeybee. And these two ranges are not only very distinct, they do not overlap. Okay, this is important. We'll be kind of coming back to this theme here this morning. Apis serrana is very distinct to the eastern part of Asia, especially the southeast. Apis mellifera, on the other hand, dominates the entire western part of Asia and Europe and Africa without any evidence of natural overlap in their ranges. This is a curiosity. This is one of those mysteries and puzzles in, in honeybee biology today is this disparate distribution between these two because it's a little bit anomalous. Normally we see in evolution we kind of see a range relationship with a genus or a, a, a closely related group. They contiguously touch one another in their evolution and spread from a particular point of origin. And it's largely believed that Southeast Asia is the native range of, of Apis. 
Uh, however, there has been some recent scholarship that is disputing this. One of the things that's happened in my lifetime has been an explosion in the quantity of data. And that data has come in the form of genetic data. Uh, the numbers of genes that organisms possess is huge, and when you would try to analyze and see their relationships across populations, one of the biggest limiting factors in this has been computer power, has been computer power. That's how vast the data that we're, that we're uncovering in genomics uh, is. It, it, it cannot be handled with smaller computers. It takes bigger computers. So this has been one of the limiters in our research of figuring out the evolutionary origin of species. But our computers are getting better, and we're being able to uh, find out these relationships with greater and greater resolution. And I think the results are interesting for beekeepers. Now, this is a complete phylogeny of honeybee, all the way back to the, the eukarya, the very beginning primordial cells. We're not going to cover this today. Instead, we're going to cover this little section at the very bottom right, which is the genus Apis itself. And I know that's hard to see, so I'm going to blow this up. This is that little section that was highlighted in the bottom. And this is just the last 10 million years. And the genus Apis is looped into, or, or it's a part of three subgenera. And the first one is called Microapis, the small dwarf honeybees. The next one is Megapis, the large giant honeybees. And then the third subgenus is the Apis, the cavity nesters. I want to go through these. What we have here in the top is the dwarf honeybees, Microapis. And my friend Zachary Huang at Michigan State University, he's a native Chinese, and he's demonstrating a nest of these small microapis, Apis floria. And they are, they're little miniature bees. And they build a single comb exposed out in the open. And their combs are distinctive because they have a horizontal part on top of the branch. They envelop the branch on which the comb is made. And on this horizontal section of the comb, it's called the dance floor because Apis florea does a very similar recruitment dance as we're familiar with with the honeybee, except they don't do it on a vertical comb. They do it on a horizontal surface, so it's much easier for them. Think about what the honeybee, ha our honeybee has to do. They have to do this little complicated code where they say, okay, there's a resource out there, and I want to tell my sisters how to find it. Okay, we're all going to pretend that the direction of the sun is straight vertical. Okay, let's all pretend that. Okay, that, that's the direction of the sun. And I'm going to do a figure eight dance. And the angle at which I do my straight run of that figure eight relative to the top of the comb is going to tell you whether it's to the left or the right of the sun when you go out to the entrance of our hive. So let's say you've gone out and there's a patch of mesquite over there and the sun is over there. Then you're going to say, okay, that's the sun straight north at the top of the comb, and then I'm going to do my little waggle dance in that direction so many degrees to the right of the sun. And they come out, the recruits, and they look at the sun. And they say, okay, well, we got to kind of go that away. And they find it. Apis florea doesn't have to do any of that. All Apis florea does is say, hey, it's over there. <laughs> See, when you live on a horizontal world, you can do that kind of thing. You can just point at it, right? So they do their little straight run just right in the direction of where the resource is. And to do that, they have to have a horizontal surface. So this is just one little interesting piece of the biology of Microapis, and it is considered the most primitive of the three subgenera. The next one is the Megapis, the giant open nesters. You've probably heard or read about these. Uh, National Geographic has a big thing about the honey hunters of Nepal, uh, these, these, these people in that region of the world who hunt these bees. Uh, they will climb up trees and they'll, the, the, the bees are savage. They're just vicious. They're extremely defensive. And um, they will, you know, cover themselves in some kind of protection and use smoke and they just hammer away with sticks at the comb until it falls to the jungle floor. 
and then their mates down on the ground, you know, pick it up. And you can find these whole huge combs in uh, village markets uh, throughout South Asia. The giant honeybee. Incidentally, you've probably heard in the news, you know, last year or so about the giant Asian hornet. And this is the natural predator of this bee. And what these bees do, I should have thought of this and put a video clip up for you, but they make this really interesting shock alarm dance to resist the giant hornets. You know, like when you drop a pebble in a pool, bloop, bloop, you get that, the concentric waves that go out from that point. Well, the bees flip their abdomens in synchrony to create this radiating bullseye like that. Look it up on YouTube. It's, it's really cool to see. And this is kind of a visual shock to the hornets, and it, you know, makes them not, you know, do hornet stuff. So anyway, that's, that's one, a couple of the things that this bee is famous about, apis, uh, megapis. And then the third one, of course, is the cavity nesting bees, the subgenus Apis. So yes, if you want to be really technical, our bee is Apis Apis mellifera. Now if you really want to be um, you know, tiresome about it, if you happen to have northern European honeybees, the old black German bees like we used to have when I was a kid growing up, that bee's proper name is Apis Apis mellifera mellifera. You know, that's the kind of things that taxonomists do. But the point being, the subgenus Apis are the cavity nesters. These are the ones that have moved away from external open single combs into cavities. They have committed now to the vertical lifestyle. They've also now started making multiple combs, and they also live in the dark. So that's a lot of changes to move from external outside living to move into these cavities, but it had a lot of benefits. For one thing, it pre-adapted this subgenus and only this subgenus to move out of tropical latitudes. So it's probably no accident that it's the cavity nesting apis that made it into Europe and the more cold regions of the world. Now what I'm showing you here in this picture is, of course, is a schematic of this lifestyle, living inside a hollow tree. But down here in the bottom right, look at the dimensions there and the scale. This is a Langstroth frame made for Apis serrana. Okay, Apis serrana is the eastern honeybee, and it's also a cavity nester, and it also tolerates some degree of human management. And yes, there is an entire line of woodenware that is scaled down to Apis serrana. It looks like a little toy, but that's a real honey frame right there of Apis serrana. Okay, so you've seen this before. We have these two distinct regions where mellifera and serrana live. Let's kind of drill into why that is the case. And then I'm gonna talk about why that matters to us as beekeepers today. Now I'm gonna move back about 14 million years. The earth looks different. See how the continents are not connected like we know them today. Uh, the Mediterranean, the Black, and the Caspian Seas are all sort of morphed into one big sea there in Central Europe. And I want to give you a couple scenarios that are out there about the um, evolutionary origin of our, of our bee. This is a very active area of research. It's changing rapidly because of the new data that's coming online and its quantity and its speed at which this, these data are being uncovered. It's really upsetting a lot of our old paradigms. But there is one piece of evidence that's been pretty robust. The earliest known fossils for the entire genus do not come from Southeast Asia. They come from Central Europe. The oldest fossils showing Apis, the entire genus, come from modern-day Germany and France. So in 2013, almost 10 years ago now, there was a very influential paper that came out and suggested a kind of radical, uh, heterodox interpretation of where the genus came from. It's European. It's not even Southeast Asian at all. It's Europe that is the origin. And they put out this scenario that kind of looks like this. From a Central European origin, the early Apis, uh, there was 
lineages of them that migrated down into Southeast Asia, and it's this lineage that proliferated and radiated and exploded and made the large number of species that we know today, about 26, of Apis. And this is what we see today. We look at Southeast Asia and we see all this taxonomic diversity and, and the reigning paradigm has been, therefore, that's where Apis came from, Southeast Asia. Well, this model is challenging that. It's suggested, too, that a separate lineage you know, emigrated in, a, in the westerly direct direction across Europe, moved across the Iberian Isthmus right here, and moved into Africa. And this is the lineage that gave rise to the modern-day mellifera. Curiously, this same paper suggests they have evidence for ancient Apis moving across Siberia and moving across the Beringia and entering into, into North America and coming down into central modern United States, currently occupied by the United States, and we have fossil evidence of Apis nearctica, a whole new species that the team members in a separate paper have published this fossil. We do have a native Apis to North America. Isn't that cool? Yeah, we have, we have grown up saying and thinking, oh, apis, you know, honeybees are all old world, you know, they're all imported into uh, North America. And yeah, that's true, but 14 million years ago, we did have our own native natural honeybee. I just think that's cool. And it's kind of a cool name, too, apis nearctica, you know, so there you go. So for whatever reason, that lineage died out. It was not successful, it, or did, well, it was successful, it lasted millions of years, but it has since gone extinct. There is one ghost left over that we see today that is a hint or a suggestion of the existence of this ancient apis. If any of you visited uh, South or Central America and in Australia and in, in Africa, they have an entire family of bees called the stingless bees, meliponi. Uh, these guys do not sting which sounds wonderful, right? Oh, great, you know, I love them. But trust me, they're still pretty obnoxious. Uh, they bite, they fly up your nose, they fly in your ears, they go for your eyes. They're, they can be nasty if they want to be, but they're also, they're big, and they also range down to the size of a gnat. And so sometimes there's a, a really common species in Central America, they're just itsy bitsy little things. And if you bumble into them, it's almost like, um, well, it's almost comical because they're, they're, they're attacking your arm. It's like, okay, this is supposed to hurt, right? You're kind of watching them, and they're working really hard trying to bite and sting, but they're too small to even make an impression on you. So they're cute. Okay, they're, they're, put it that way, they're cute. And they do practice melopona culture in those parts of the world, and they produce a honey, but it's a very thin, watery honey. They um, process it differently. And it's used not so much for food as it is for an eye medication. It's a traditional eye remedy in, in a lot of these parts of the world. So you can go down, you know, tomorrow, fly down to Guatemala and find these melipona uh, honey for sale in the markets. And it's usually used as a, as a native eye ointment. Why did melipona never penetrate into North America? You know, it's in Africa, it's in, you know, all latitudes of South and Central America, it's in Australia, but it's not in North America. Well, one of the hypotheses that's put out is that the, the niche for a social honey-gathering bee was already occupied by Apis nearctica. So there was no ecological room for that other honey-collecting um, social bee to move north into North America. It's probably an example of ecologic exclusion. This is speculative, of course, but it's these kinds of events in history that dictate modern ranges of species that we see today. Everything does have a cause. Okay, I want to zero in now on mellifera in particular. Okay, we've talked about the genus, we've talked about Apis serrana, I haven't mentioned the other species that exist to this day in Southeast Asia. Um, I want to drill in a little bit about mellifera. What you're seeing here are some different ideas of how mellifera has um, 
radiated beginning back from 1988 it was a very influential paper that has been surprisingly robust and this one was based on pure morphology this was before the genomics revolution they were just simply looking at morphology of the animal and trying to figure out its different ranges and over the years there's been this this big sun you see is the supposed radiation point of the genus mellifera and this 1988 paper suggested that the species mellifera originated in far west asia our modern day middle east um, there has been some jockeying back and forth another paper came out in 2006 that made a very strong case for africa as the point of origin in fact the title of that paper I scarfed for the title of this lecture because they said in 2006 out of Africa they were suggesting that mellifera is fundamentally an African species in 2017 see how quickly these data are, these, these dates are converging now in 2017 that, that bulk of evidence shifted back to Africa and actually said, you know, there's kind of a case for two radiation points, one in the Middle East and another in Africa. The most recent, which came out last year, 2021, goes back to uh, the Middle East as the entry point, the point of origin of Apis mellifera. And then, so it, it's, it's kind of always back and forth between those two. It's either the Middle East or it's in Africa. And we see kind of a, kind of a, you know, a majority of data starting to converge on the Middle East and Western Asia as the point of geographic origin of our species, mellifera. Regardless of whether it's out of Africa or out of Asia, there are several lineages of mellifera that radiated out from that point of origin. And one of them that's very consistent is the so-called A lineage, which moved down into Africa, and then an M lineage which moved over the um, modern-day Baltic and Caspian Seas up into northern Europe and then a C lineage which moved independently into southern Europe. I'm going to talk about these and how it kind of plays out. We are particularly interested in the M and the C lineages because these are the family lines of mellifera that gave rise to the species that we use in beekeeping today. Next, we enter the glaciers. The glaciers are very active in this. We have the species, Apis mellifera, and then we also have subspecies, biotypes, or races, depending colloquially on the terms that are used. But a subspecies is just simply an identifiable, geographically distinct population of one particular species. Subspecies can still interbreed. They are still the same species. They're just different biotypes of that species. And for these, we have the glaciers to thank. And here I'm showing you a bunch of European glaciers all superimposed in one graph, even though they had different uh, points of origin. But I want to talk about this one right here, this glaciers between the, uh, the Pyrenees, or in the Pyrenees Mountains, which separate Spain from France. Uh, if you've been to Europe and hiked these, they're beautiful. And they were also, you know, mountains are always the first to be glaciated and the last to not be glaciated during a cold phase. But these glaciers were important because they separated for a time the populations of mellifera in Spain from the populations of mellifera in the rest of Europe. And this is one of the ways that subspecies are created. And subspecies are just simply the first step toward a new species being created. When the populations are cut off from one another, oftentimes through a physical thing, uh, like a glacier, or it could be an earthquake that separates a peninsula from the mainland, things that cause a physical separation between one population prevent that entire population from interbreeding. And given enough time, you have genetic divergence in the two populations to the point that they become less and less genetically compatible, ultimately to the point they can no longer interbreed, and then we call them a new species. So these types of processes is how new species get birthed. This is how new species happen. There's other ways this can happen. Sometimes you can have a very genetically diverse successful population colonize a large swath of territory like a continent 
and then local extinctions happen here and there. So the separation can happen that way too. So that pop, but the point being, eventually you end up with populations that are interfertile and not interfertile with other populations. And at that point, we have a new species. So here we have the Vermian Glacier, which came in and separated Spain from Europe. And so eventually, the mellifera in Spain started being genetically different from those in the rest of Europe. If the process is not gone on long enough, or if the process is interrupted, then you still have interfertile species. And this appears to be the case with mellifera. These different races of mellifera that we talk about in the beekeeping books, they're sort of taking the first step toward being a new species, but they haven't really committed to it yet. They are still completely interfertile, but yet we can recognize them, and there are economically important characteristics of these different species that we as beekeepers kind of like. Both of these subspecies are present in North America. Uh, we, the, in the eastern coast, you know, eastern North America was largely colonized uh, during the European colonization period uh, by England, France, Whereas Spain tended to colonize, they went around the Tierra del Fuego and came up the west coast, and the Spaniards imported their bee into the American Southwest, which was Apis mellifera iberiensis. And so to this day, we can still find genetic traces of these subspecies in our bees. And yes, it's still true to this day, uh, iberiensis can still be found in the American Southwest. It's, it's quite rare over here. Of course, you know there's been a lot of water over the dam, hasn't there? And now we got African bees that are moving into the South. And so that's all getting muddled up by human interference. But these genetic ghosts are still detectable. Another one that's really interesting to us is this glacier over the Alps. The Alps separate northern Italy from the rest of Europe. And once again, these mountains are going to catch and retain these glaciers. And so for a similar period of time, Italy was cut off from the rest of Europe. And this gives us our beloved Apis mellifera ligustica, the Italian honeybee. And what did it separate from? It separated from its sister subspecies, which is Apis mellifera carnica. So Carnica and Ligustica were cut off from one another, and that's why we have today the modern Carniolans and the modern Italians. Of course, other species and subspeciation happen in other parts. We have the Caucasian bees from over here in the Caucasus region uh, between the Black Sea and the uh, Caspian Sea. We have Syriensis down here in the modern-day Middle East. We have Anatolia, which is right here in Turkey. And these were all similarly separated from one another, made distinct from one another by their own local subspeciation conditions. But it all results in different behaviors, different morphology, some of which uh, we as beekeepers like. So between the M lineage of Europe and the A lineage of Africa, there are two very different ecologies. We hear up here on the left what the primitive tropical state was like. If you're in growing up and evolving in Africa, your conditions are quite different than if you're evolving in Europe. And so you're going to be oriented toward a lot of swarming. Uh, nectar flows are more or less always available, so you don't really have to invest in a big food supply because there's always a nectar flow tomorrow. So why bother? So what you do instead, if you're temp tropically evolved, you're just going to invest in reproducing. So to this day, the African subspecies are much more oriented toward rapid swarming. They do not develop a big population. They don't need to. They don't need it for temperature thermoregulation. They don't need it for foraging. They don't need to get a huge winter honey supply. They can get by on a lot less. They're much more nimble. They're much more nimble. They can stay ahead of the ecosystem. Whereas if you're temperately evolved from Europe, you're going to have a very different life cycle. For one thing, it's going to be very important how you survive winter. You're basically, your, 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 your entire emphasis is on winter survival instead of swarming. You can really only afford to swarm once. 
We're going to store up a big food supply so that we can survive winter. And we're going to reproduce early. And we have to do it early in the season so that when, when our colony splits and the parent hive gives birth to a swarm, it has to be early in the year so both of us can recover and get a big food supply in time for the next winter. You know, it's always winter, right? Winter is coming. Pun there. Some of you got it. But that's what the temperate bees are all about. Surviving that long winter, uh, making a big honey supply, swarming once, maybe twice a year. Their, their whole orientation is different. And we, of course, exploit that, don't we? we, we whether, whether we got African bees or whether we got European bees, we can see pros and cons for either approach, and we manage them accordingly. But we're kind of jumping on board their evolutionary history and tweaking it with our management to get the most honey out of them that we can. Again, looking at mellifera, and these are the, the, some of the lineages I've talked about. There's others, but here's the big A lineage of mellifera. And this includes some um, pretty important subspecies, the most important of which is Scutellata, this one right here, the East Central African honeybee, and I had a student, he was an undergraduate, he was a clever guy, and he remembered the subspecies name of, of the African bee by saying if you encounter them, you want to scoot on out of there. So Apis mellifera scutellata is in the A lineage. Uh, the M lineage has our friend mellifera mellifera and Iberiensis. The C lineage, which is one of the youngest, most recent lineages, includes Carnica and Ligustica. Just 2016, there was a new subspecies recognized that extended the natural range of mellifera all the way into Central Europe, but still not overlapping with Serrana. And this is a, the newest subspecies. Here you can add this to your next master beekeeper exam for a bonus point. It's Apis mellifera sinizinuan. Woo! God, that's hard to say. Sinusinuan. Yeah, there you go. So the newest subspecies of Apis mellifera has now been unveiled, and so it also extends the known natural range of the species considerably. Okay, so much for natural stuff. Enter human beings. This is the actual language of the first record that we have of Apis mellifera being imported into the New World. And it's dated 1621. It is from a ship manifest from England depositing bees in Virginia. We have by this ship sent fruit trees as also pigeons and beehives. The preservation and increase hereof we recommend unto you. And there you have it, the first historic record of Apis mellifera being brought over here first historic record. We have fossil record of that ancient apis over here, but this is the first time we have historic record of mellifera being imported into the new world. Okay, back to my three pests, and let's kind of drill into their experiences and why they were what they were and how all this ties into the biogeography. Back to the tracheomite. What you're seeing here is uh, an illustration of this mite. It is tiny. There are actually three of them. Apis, or Acarapis dorsalis is this tiny little mite. It likes to live right on the top of the thorax. And this is the, this is the thorax of a bee right here. And these are the mites. And I've made them really, really tiny, just it's tiny enough to see on the screen, but just to show that they're tiny. But this Acarapis dorsalis likes to live on the top of the thorax. Acarapis externus likes to live in the neck region between the head and the thorax. This picture here on the thorax, this is the diagram, and this is an actual photograph of the spiracular flap. Okay, the spiracle is like the nostril of the bee, and it's not in their face, it's in the side of their thorax. And there's this lobe called the spiracular lobe that covers, and here I'm showing it right here, it actually covers that spiracular opening. I've had to shave this bee to make this photograph because it's, you kind of shave off the hair and then you can get down there and see the features. But this spiracular flap is very much like our nostrils. It's very hairy 
and it's just to keep dirt and stuff out of there. Well, the, 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 the prevailing thinking is that one of these acarapus figured out that, hey, it's kind of nice inside that spiracular flap. And this is the origin of Acarapus woodi, the youngest, most recent members of the genus Acarapus. And this mite moved from the neck region of the bee and just made that small little niche shift a few centimeters or a few millimeters away, entered that flap, and there it found a very cozy environment indeed. Inside that tracheal tube, it had high humidity. It had a ready supply of hemolymph. It could suck or could pierce the wall of the tracheal tube and suck the blood of the bee. It could lay eggs in that tracheal tube. And it would cause all sorts of physical injury to the trachea and physically block the trachea. It sounds just horrific. I mean, God, can you imagine how much you'd have to blow your, I mean, just you'd blow your nose and you'd feel awful having these mites living up inside your sinuses. Okay, that, that's what these poor bees were uh, enduring. However, the experience was like two years and it was over with. What in the world was going on here? We have a precedent. In 1917, in England, there is a widely publicized bee epidemic that mirrors this almost to a T. They called it the Isle of Wight disease. The Isle of Wight is a big island off the southern coast of England, and that's where it was first found, but then it spread throughout the rest of the country. And the symptoms were virtually identical to what we were having here in North America with the tracheomite in the late 80s and early 90s. Dramatic colony die-off rapid recovery, and then just virtual disappearance. To this day, I have to hunt hard to find tracheomites, you know, to include on exams. I mean, you just can't find the things. They're, they're extraordinarily rare. What was going on? My academic grandfather, Roger Morse, he was the advisor to my advisor. Okay, so it works. And Roger was a, a very prolific author back in the 70s and 80s, and you can still see, find some of his books. But Roger put forward a preposterous idea, which at the time made my toes curl. He says, well, obviously, Acarapus woodi has evolved since the Europeans brought bees over to um, North America. And they had it, and we didn't, so that when it showed up, it was devastating to us. And I thought, oh, God, Roger, don't say that. That's, it, you know, evolution is not the stuff of daily news. Okay, it's not like, well, today we had a new species evolve in Southeast Asia. You know, it, it doesn't work like that, Roger. Well, the funny thing is, since then, he's been sort of vindicated because we have found some emerging evidence that sometimes extremely rapid evolution events can occur. So it's not necessarily as... Um, committed to long time segments as we formerly thought. There is no better theory out there that somehow in the 400 years since Europeans brought the, our bees over, the two populations had separate evolutionary histories, didn't they? In Europe, the Acarapus probably made this transition near the time that the Isle of Wight disease was documented and caused its devastation. And then at some point, that mite was introduced into North America where it encountered a population that had no history of it at all and was very dramatic and harmful for a brief time. But why so brief in its endurance and its effects? Because the relationship between Apis and Acarapus was very ancient and very well established. It was not a recent parasitism, it was just a modification of an existing parasitism. So that whatever mechanisms the bees in England evolved in the early 20th century were the same kind of mechanisms that our bees evolved. Well, that's me. See, I got your interests in mind so the speaker doesn't talk too long. But hastening on. The, the relationship was so recent that it was a fairly easy thing for mellifera to evolve the resistance mechanisms against this new acarapus that had showed up. Moving on to the small hive beetle. Um, my 
former student, Jamie Ellis, I think he's spoken for you before. He's a, a good speaker. You want to get him. Uh, Jamie, when he was working with me, we had this opportunity to do a comparative study of uh, small hive beetles in Georgia versus small hive beetle effects in Africa. And so we set up this really cool comparative study. We had colonies in Georgia, we had colonies in South Africa, and we introduced a fixed number of small hive beetles into each hive, and then we just tracked their effects. And it's pretty straightforward here. The top left, these are bees in South Africa. There was no effect of beetles on sealed brood. Black bars are with beetles, gray bars without. And in, when it comes to populations, there's actually more bees in those colonies in South Africa where we had infected with small hive beetles. Very different situation in Georgia. In Georgia, we had profound reduction in brood production, and we had a significant reduction in bee population in those we inoculated. So obviously, the bees in Georgia were less resistant to small hive beetles as the bees in South Africa. The small hive beetle is native to Africa. So the best reigning hypothesis at this point is that the small hive beetle made its adaptation from whatever other host that it was living off of onto the bee bread and honey of the native mellifera bees in Africa, and it made that transition sometime after the M lineage left Africa. So once again, they had that separation in time and place. The M mellifera was up in Europe. The A mellifera were still down in Africa. The small hive beetle evolved in Africa and only later was introduced to the European mellifera where it has and continues to give its mischief to honeybees. What about Varroa? For Varroa, we have to look back to the bees and the mites of Asia because here is another one of life's big mysteries. Mellifera has no natural mite. It has none alone of its genus. There is no external parasitic Asiatic mite in mellifera. The, all the other Asian mellifera do. Uh, take a look at like the, the Apis serrana. They have Varroa destructor, Varroa jacobsoni, Varroa underwood eye. Uh, Apis nuluensis has underwood eye and renderer eye and underwood eye. All these, all these mites on each of their own particular Apis host, except for mellifera. And I think this is one of the most important pieces of evidence out of biogeography that, that supports and underscores this geographic separation, this geographic uniqueness of mellifera. And the paper from 2013 that suggests a European origin of the genus and sees the genus extending down into Africa from the Iberian Peninsula raises the tantalizing possibility that mellifera has never had Varroa, ever, in its, in its evolutionary history. It, it, it doesn't even come from a lineage that had parasitic mites. Just doesn't have it. Doesn't have the evolved hardware for dealing with it at all. And I think this is important for us as beekeepers, and especially as bee breeders, and I think it sort of corroborates what we have seen in the 30 years we have had Varroa mite. Why has the search for genetic resistance been so intractable for Varroa mite? It is a hard nut to crack. And I don't know about you, but I'll bear my soul. I think that the overall project of finding resistance against Varroa has been rather underwhelming, okay? I mean, yeah, it's out there, okay? But you just don't have bees which you can just completely leave uh, without any supplemental management or treatment on our part. <sighs> there is measurable resistance and hygienic is one of them, grooming is one of them, but every time we see a case of that, it is an evolved behavior against another pest. And we breeders have come in and ramped up that particular set of behaviors and co-opted it, if you will, and repurposed it to a new parasite for which it has no natural history whatsoever. It's a tall order for us to think that we can breed resistance into Apis mellifera. And it's just good to know that. This is the evolutionary history that explains why resistance is so intractable in mellifera 
against the Varroa mite. So here you have it, kind of a summation. The experience of honeybees with Acarapus is really, really brief. Their relationship has been long, and the evolved wood eye, that is probably only a 400-year event, roughly. The experience with a uh, small hive beetle happened probably sometime around 5 million years ago. The relationship with Varroa is, you know, probably, if it exists, about 7 million years ago. And to play all that out, just to kind of show you this, the length of time that you have had that relationship, you know, is related to your ability to withstand that relationship. But there's also the tantalizing possibility that Varroa just simply is a fiction, and it has no experience with it at all. So these, the length of time the species have had to evolve together dictates the relative benignness of the parasite-host relationship. There are other pests in bees that are similarly explained. This is a gradient of increasing severity from the bottom to the top. And here we have at the very bottom the greater wax moth. It's a, it's a cohabitor with bees. It's a natural facultative commensal mutualist. It's actually a beneficial, okay? It's actually a beneficial because it cleans out the cavities of pathogens and makes them livable and healthy for the next swarm occupant. Uh, moving up a little bit, we have the bee louse. This is a fly that has lost its wings. And you still, eh, it's kind of hard. I, I've only seen them live once in my life. Uh, varroa treatments have probably taken out the bee louse, but it's pretty harmless. It will just kind of hang out on, on bees, especially queens, and eat the stuff like pollen that's off their bodies. And then we have the genus Acarapus, two of which appear to be completely benign, Dorsalis and Externus, one of which, however, is apparently a recent recently evolved parasite. However, because the relationship with Acarapus is fairly old, uh, it was pretty easy for mellifera to evolve resistance to it. Next we have the small hive beetle. It's a little bit more of a pest, um, but because its relationship is about, you know, five million years old, it was doable to have some kind of resistance. But for Varroa, with a relationship of seven million years old since they've been together, uh, it's been much more difficult, or maybe never at all. I don't work in a vacuum. I work with a, a happy group of other collaborators, and um, they have all, in one way or another, participated in this talk and in the uh, research and lectures I'll be giving the rest of the day. I'm done with my prepared comments, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>